Good evening. Welcome to Hashtag Small Screen Fun. I'm Johanna Evans, the film programmer at The Hop, and I could not be more excited for tonight's chat with Katie Silverman, class of 09. We're so thrilled that you were able to join us, Katie, to talk about your film, Book Smart. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for having me. This is so cool. I'm so excited to be here and get to chat with you guys. Well, of course, we in the programming department here at The Hop are thrilled. We screened your film last spring as a special advanced screening and had about 200 kids in the house and it was just such a pleasure. But um, we have some students who are gonna join us later to ask you a few questions as well. And then they'll be monitoring the chat field for the latter half of this conversation. So for those of you who are tuning in at home, we encourage you to start submitting your questions as soon as they come to mind, and we'll get to as many as we can over the course of the evening. So let's get started. My first question is about your journey as a screenwriter. It sounds from an alumni interview that you were obsessed with screenwriting, even as a student here, and using your entire green print budget at the very beginning of the term to print out screenplays to read. And then you went to film school at Columbia, and moved to LA and pretty soon had two screenplays under your belt. The romantic comedies set it up and isn't it romantic and then landed the dream job of working on Book Smart with Olivia Wilde. So my question is, what is the hardest part? Of, of screenwriting or of the journey? Of this journey? What was the hardest part of that journey? Oh man, I think Specifically coming from Dartmouth, where so many of my classmates and my peers and my friends uh, were so brilliant and, and on a path leading them towards careers as doctors or lawyers or, or working in finance in ways that had really clear steps. I think it was very hard for me in the beginning to figure out a way that felt a way into this that felt like a ladder I could climb because there are so many different ways into it and it's not really something there are there are plenty of steps that everybody takes coming out here and and in general there's a way you evolve as a writer and evolve as someone working with people in Hollywood in general but I think it was tough for me to figure out like what is my way in and I it was very helpful when I realized that there isn't one and you kind of make your own as you're going along so as you were saying going to film school I think was a very Dartmouth decision, which is like, here's the next step I could take. That is another school I'm familiar with, and it feels like it's a step on this ladder. But I learned as much after film school when I came out to Los Angeles. I worked as an assistant to this extraordinary writer named Dana Fox, who I continue to write with a lot. And and I met assistants and people who had not gone to college at all, or people who had come right from college to work as an assistant, or people who were trying to be writers and working in coffee shops and seeing all the different paths that they were taking and figuring out that you just have to carve your own as you're going was a difficult thing to wrap my head around, I think. But then once I was there, I was it, easier to navigate. Well, and those twists and turns sound a lot like actually what comes up in the film. And um, I mean, I just admire your fearlessness of, you know, plun plunging into that. And your film, of course, um, Booksmart is also fearless. And there's no moment that um, exemplifies this more than the conversation about the panda. <laughs> so, there are a lot of fans, of course, who, you know, also have a lot to say and think this scene is fantastic and have creative ideas around it. Um, but my question is actually, um, this. This scene is really kind of revolutionary. There aren't a lot of scenes in film that talk so frankly about teenage girl self-care, pardon the euphemism. Is is there anything that was even riskier or or you know even more adventurous that didn't make it into the film or or just you know other scenes that that were cut cuz you know it's a it the creativity in the film is abundant but is was there anything that was cut that you were sorry to miss? There was so, I mean, we had a true embarrassment of riches and everything we cut, I was sad to miss and some were particularly painful. They, I mean, in general, I think the fearlessness that anyone feels watching the movie, which I feel too watching it comes from Olivia, our director, who is not just a fearless person, but a really fearless filmmaker and was very inspiring and encouraging all of us to approach this movie that I think a lot of people could have said was like a high school comedy or a girl's comedy or, or something that you would put in a box that way. And she 
her comps for this movie were Training Day and The Big Lebowski and Fast Times and all these movies that that uh, are stylistically and kind of comedically and just in general braver maybe than the genre gives them credit for. So that was a really fun way to approach all of these things and to encourage everyone from Beanie and Caitlin to me to every other department head to go as balls out as we could in everything. I I would say my favorite part, uh, probably my favorite scene in the script it didn't end up in the movie, which, oh, no. was, not, which was a, a really classic example of Kill Your Darlings, because at the time I was like, there's no way this isn't the most important scene in the entire thing. <laughs> and then slowly as we showed cuts to people, everyone was like, you don't really need that. It was, it had to do with the panda. It w There used to be a lot more um, fantasies in the movie, kind of going into Molly and Amy's heads the same way we do with Molly when she arrives at the party, when we see that great dance fantasy, there were a few more of those scattered throughout. And one of them was that as Molly and Amy were driving to the first party with Jared, Amy looked out the window and saw Ryan driving her car with a life-sized uh, Ling Ling the Panda in the front seat, like a human man who we had in a full panda suit. And then they started like very aggressively making out and, and getting in each other's business in the car as Amy was watching from the other side. And it was, I mean, we filmed that. We filmed on a road in the valley, uh, Victoria, the amazing actress who plays Ryan and a very sweet man in a panda costume in the car with Caitlin on the other side. And it was so much fun to film and I loved it so much. And it momentum wise didn't fit where it was, but that was, I love knowing that that's out there somewhere on a hard drive, it made me very happy. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. I mean, one of my other favorite creative flourishes in the film is the drug trip that they go on um, yes. where they both turn into Barbie dolls. And um, it was such a surprise when we got there in the film. And I love how the two characters have totally different reactions. And um, is what was it like putting that scene together? Was that in the script from the beginning or um, or did you stumble on that? No, it wasn't in the script. So I was the, the fourth writer to come on to the project. Unfortunately, I didn't get to work with any of the other three women who were working on it before me, Emily and Sarah and Susanna, who are so talented. There had been kind of two different iterations a few years apart of people kind of trying to tackle this same idea. And But when I did come on, Olivia was attached to direct and, and she and I wanted to kind of re-break it and, and come at it from a different angle. And one thing that she said when I came on was, I want to have a drug trip where they turn into Barbies because she loves miniatures. She had actually been wanting to put that in something previously and there was no context for it. Like there was no place. And so then I had the really fun job of trying to figure out where the best place to put that was and to work with her. And I had in a previous uh, script that I had thought I might write, come up with an idea that someone a young woman got, accidentally got high and they only realized it because she got really upset about her mom and that that was like her trigger. And I was excited to try and combine those two things and put them in together. And so and we eventually, we landed on it happening at the theater party, which made a lot of sense to us, but we had it in different places throughout the script in mm -hmm. at different times. Sometimes it was at Nick's house, sometimes it was other places. And it was a really long process. So it's, I think, 60 to 90 seconds in the movie and it was a months and months long process we it's it originally was a little more of like an adventure movie like honey i shrunk the kids they were running for cats and roombas and stuff but the process <laughs> worked with this incredible company in portland called shadow machine they do a lot of the robot chicken stuff they work with stop motion mm -hmm. and so we had versions of the script we, i mean we probably had like 20 to 30 different versions of what that scene looked like throughout and it we would work with them and they would do an animatic which is where they do mm -hmm. kind of drawing of what it will eventually look like because you need to make sure everything is perfect before they do it because you can't change anything so we also as we were working through the different versions a lot of times olivia and i would go in and record it so we could see it on the animatic before we gave it to beanie and caitlin so we could figure out exactly what we wanted by the time we finally settled on it we were able to go up to Portland and see them create the dolls, which was also crazy because it was like two, Olivia and I being like, we need bigger boobs and a small waist. And we were like, not used to women coming up and saying this. But um, it was so much fun to tackle because the idea that there, for these two young, ardent, like passionate, zealot feminists, the real nightmare would be to be in like this, uh, the perfect image of the patriarchy, these, these mm -hmm. dolls. They think that's the real nightmare and the actual real nightmare is you get into them and you're like, actually, I kind of like it and I want to stay here. And then they have to fight that urge as well. 
Well, and there are so many clever twists with, you know, with feminism in, in the film, but I'm not going to steal the thunder from the students because I know that they have a couple of questions related to that. Uh, the first student we're going to bring in is Nick Gutierrez, who is director of the Dartmouth Film Society. Hi, Nick. Hi, Hi, Hi Katie. Um, so my first question is sort of like jumping off of what you were talking about with the development of the script. Um, you mentioned in your alumni interview recently that you found an early version of the script in 2009 and it was on the Hollywood blacklist for a couple of years as like unproducible. So I guess I'm really curious what state the script was in when you were brought on board and like like how much did it change from from in when you got it to final result? That's a great question. Yeah, the, so the blacklist, if anyone's unfamiliar, is a list that a bunch of different industry officials make at the end of the year that are kind of the most well-liked or well-remembered script of the year. And in 2009, Emily and Sarah's draft of Booksmart was on that list and I was so excited because it was exactly the kind of movie that I would love to watch. So that is what I printed at Dartmouth. I was very excited about it. And um, that, you know, it, it went through three kind of different iterations, the way a lot of scripts do in Hollywood, both in terms of when is the industry, when is society ready for a different kind of story, and how do these stories adjust to what's going on in the real world. So it's, and that 2009 script is, I think, available online. I know the, the draft I wrote is available online too, but it's a cool thing to look and see kind of how these scripts evolve over a decade, basically, is when that happened. So when I came on, uh, Susanna Fogel had, had come on and rewritten the Emily and Sarah draft, I believe in 2014, and had changed a lot of fundamental things. All three versions of the script kind of had the same idea at its core, which was it's about these two best friends who really love each other and getting to show smart girls in a way that we hopefully hadn't seen in a movie before. Emily and Sarah's version, uh, the, I would say the transition from Emily and Sarah to Susanna's version was a, a lot of big structural stuff. Susanna uh, made Amy gay, which was a big change. I mean, not so big a change in that it was still a love story, but like that was a significant change, I think also in terms of what you were able to do from 2009 to 2014 mm -hmm. and, and change the structure so that it was over one night as opposed to over the spring semester of a high school senior year. So when I came on, some of those big fundamental changes had already happened. I was excited because I, when I met with Olivia, I got to kind of pitch just what is the high school movie that I would want to make. And, and I had wanted to tell a story for a long time about a smart kid realizing that everyone else was smart, because that was what I discovered when I went to Dartmouth, <laughs> which was that I had thought I was like the smart, responsible kid who didn't party or do anything fun because I was making the right choice and being responsible and I showed up here and everyone was much cooler than me and had done all that stuff anyway and showed up in Hanover not having to choose at all. And and I found that in my high school as well. All the kids I assumed were were kind of like lazy and I mean I shouldn't say lazy, that's a tradition, but not focused on school as much. I just didn't understand the full complexity of of them and that they couldn't be put in a box just as much as I couldn't be put in a box. So it felt like this, the kind of core idea, the idea that we want to tell a story about these two best friends and, and these, you know, smart girls who try and go on an adventure. It, it, I felt so lucky that it fit within a story that I was already excited to tell. And then Olivia and I got to develop that story and kind of tell that arc together, which was really fun. Perfect. Wow. Thank you. What a great question. And yeah, I mean, Nick, I'm sure you also identify with what Katie was saying about, um, that surprise when you when you get to Dartmouth and realize that you there are so many other ways you could have gotten there and so so many different varied people. Um, that was that was a great question. All right, next we're gonna bring in Katie Orenstein, who actually I think may have have a good follow up question for this part of the conversation. Hi, Katie. Yeah, um, I have um, I've got chapstick, <laughs> uh, hand sanitizer. I've got a follow up question. And my fanny pack. So, um, I love this movie. Um, something that really makes me excited about it is there's this really ex interesting motif of um, elitism and sort of popularity. You know, Amy and Molly are both excited about pursuing really altruistic careers, you know, um, uh, going to Botswana, wanting to be a Supreme Court justice. But at the same time, um, Molly, perhaps a little bit more than Amy, um, builds her identity around 
feeling like she's better than other people. And the moment that in the screenshot that we're looking at right now in the in the still is when that world crumbles. So um, you kind of hinted at how your experience going to Dartmouth maybe changed this, but like something you and I have in common besides a great first name is this rather elite institution. So like, how did you work elitism and ideas about success and altruism and achievement into this comedy, romantic teen script? That's a great question. I can't believe you didn't have any mace in there. It's like the only thing you really need. <laughs> in um, I think we really wanted to tell a story about judgment. Like that, it felt like was the core theme we wanted throughout, which is both kind of that everybody that you think you have a snap judgment of, if you were to spend a little more time with them, you'd understand more going into it. And school is so specifically that snap judgment. Like you only see so many of your classmates, especially Molly and Amy, they only see their classmates in the school building for these eight hours. And this adventure that they go on seeing all these class, these, their classmates in their kind of at home world, even though it's silly, it's like Jared on the boat or George throwing his party or, or Nick in the way that they celebrate on weekends. Like there is something about seeing these kids out of school that they can't help but see them as more three dimensional people. They all are something more than that. And I think there was a real opportunity that we were excited to take advantage of in it being a high school movie because high school and movies are two arenas in which it's very easy to make a snap judgment and think you know everything about it. It's, you know, this kid is the nerd, this kid is the jock, this kid is the popular kid, this is the mean girl. And we wanted to take advantage of how an audience would assume they know everything about those characters the way you maybe have in other high school movies and be able to flip all of them on their head. So I think as, as much as it's about kind of elitism and that thing and that mindset, it, it was more about, or as much I think for us about making sure that we're breaking open the boxes, that it's really easy to put people in. Because the other thing is, if you're putting other people in boxes, you're definitely putting yourself in a box. And Molly doesn't believe that she can be smart and fun because she believes everyone else has to only be one thing too. And what they both kind of discover on this adventure is how much they want to be more than one thing, which is I think what graduating high school and being in college in this age range really hopefully helps people identify about themselves and explore like all the other different things that they want to be. So we were excited to set up that first act of like, you think you know who all these people are. And then over the course of this night, we're going to poke holes in all of that and reveal them all to be a little bit different. You know, just a follow up question, um, Katie, when you and I were in college, you know, social media was just barely a thing, you know, like Facebook was just starting when when you and I were students. Um, I wonder how how you're thinking about judgment and about, you know, presenting yourself as, you know, a particular branded thing like it. Um, I'm wondering when you when you started germinating on that idea and whether you have a perspective on how social media might fit into that puzzle? I think it fits it in a huge way. It's interesting because for this movie, we wanted, I think we recognize that all the best high school movies, all our favorite high school movies, I should say, feel very timely and also very timeless. So they feel like in Clueless, it's like the electric uh, closet and the cell phones and all that stuff. Like it feels very of the 90s, but the movie doesn't hinge on what those technologies do the same way that, you know, obviously movies about the 80s don't, but, you know, modern movies kind of have to deal with that, especially because by the time they come out, the technology is already old, usually, like even 18 months later. So we wanted to, to take advantage of social media in a way that for our characters would help, which is that they, as you're saying, like they see things through the lens of how people are presenting themselves, but also they feel very far away from it. Like they're able to use social media in the beginning to try and track down the parties and to be clever <laughs> find clues in them to to track them down as well but that it's not something that we needed to bank on so that when people watch the movie in 10 years it feels incredibly dated it's why we even the stylistic choice olivia made of not showing it on any specific media platform like just that like these videos and the way people present themselves will continue to happen even if the platform changes that's brilliant that's great He's well brilliant. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Katie, for a great question. And our next student joining us in the chat is Madeline Donahue, class of 20, who's a film studies major. 
Hi, Hi. thanks for being here, huge fan. Um, one of my favorite parts of Booksmart is the dialogue between Molly and Amy. And I mean, from personal experience, usually when me and my friends get together and we're talking a mile a minute, people around us usually think that we're speaking a different language, which makes it so special. But you were able to do that in a way that invites the audience into their circle. How do you go about writing dialogue that is so specific to characters' mannerisms and their intimacy without losing the engagement and understanding of the audience? That's such a great question. I love writing dialogue. It's my favorite part of screenwriting. I think it's why I like it more than other writing. <laughs> I wish I could just do dialogue all the time. And I especially like, as you were saying, the dialogue of friendships or loving relationships, that kind of intimacy as you're saying that it like is its own language and i think kind of in general the, the way i've been really lucky in that to set it up and uh and book smart were two movies that i was on set for i got to be a producer on this as well and and so much of what i like to do and what i recommend for writers in general is to adjust to the actors that you have in front of you and so i think and that's not always the case i mean if you're like an aaron sorkin or a greta gerwig and it's word perfect you're like yeah it's word perfect go say what they told you to say but <laughs> i really like fitting dialogue into the way that that an actor naturally speaks i think it, it's inspiring for me in terms of you know coming up with alts coming up with alternate lines but i also think making it sound like it's coming from their actual mouth which it is only like you know weights the realism of what they're saying even more. So this was the most fun and, and inspiring process because during casting, this movie was cast by Alison Jones, who's the greatest casting director in the world. She's responsible for anything you've ever laughed at. Like she just kind of <laughs> and and Olivia was so collaborative and and she we would cast these people and then sit with them and meet with them. I mean the rehearsal process with Beanie and Caitlin specifically and, and how much time the four of us were able to spend together and really hear things in their voices like the, the compliment off in their montage that was always there but we got to add things that they really say to each other in the way that we say them and which made that scene so much more fun to me because i felt like it really sounded like them other people like victoria ruesga who's amazing who plays ryan or nico haraga who plays tanner like they olivia and allison found actors that maybe didn't quite fit what we had written for or were so extraordinary that then we added so much more for them in their own voice and getting to know them and, and write to them was fun that way. So I think the more you know your actors, actually the more I know the actors, I think the easier it is to write in a way that sounds like the intimacy of, of the real world. I also think just in terms of friendships, it's, you know, like we talked a lot about how like friends don't look at each other or say, the other person's name or reference anything that is would be helpful to an audience member like it's <laughs> that those are all the things that highlight i think it feeling written and it feeling creative and not like a real friendship we were given the great gift of having beanie and caitlin who dove so deep into being friends so immediately and were so open to that they lived together the entire shoot and pre-production so they had kind of a built-in intimacy that way but i think it's also it's as you're saying picking up on building a history that then you can reference without it feeling inauthentic or false mm -hmm. because that's what i always want to feel in a friendship on screen is that they really love each other and that they really know each other wow great Thank question you. all right we're going to bring the band back together um nick kdo you want to join us back in and um now we're going to open it up for an audience q a i know we've got a bunch of questions coming into the chat already and uh nick do you have one to start us off Yes, I have uh, a couple here that are selfishly along the lines of questions I had anyway. <laughs> um, so Estelle asks, asks um, may, uh, how you navigated the screenwriting world and found publication and directors for your work. And along those lines, Kavya Menon 20 also asks, when you arrived in LA, how did you go about finding a job as a writer's assistant? This is the question that I wanted the answer the most to. And when I was starting out, uh, it's all, all I wanted to know was like, how did you get an agent or how did you get your first job or what did you do doing these things? And it's tough because it really is incredibly uh, like specific and individualistic. And there isn't, and people would say like, you know, you go out and try and I was like, no, I want to know exactly your calendar of like how you got this and what you did. <laughs> and which I think is a very Dartmouth quality probably. And it's my like pathway 
I think was a combination of luck and a lot of preparation. So when I was at Dartmouth, I, I paid for a subscription to something called IMDb Pro, which is the a version of the IMDb website where you get the contact information for all these agencies and production companies. And I found, I wrote a list of every writer that I loved and every TV show that I loved. And I cold emailed all of their agents and asked if any of them needed assistance, <laughs> which is, and I have told this story before, which is like a real invitation for everyone to do that to me as well. And they do, <laughs> which is I love. And, and my other advice is to follow up because a lot of people, I mean, it's not that many, but a few people very kindly wrote back to me. And, and when I get emails from people, which I'm always so touched by and I love reading and I love responding to, I, I also need kind of a kick in the pants to remember. And most people did not need an assistant. And so I went to film school instead because I was like, I don't know what my job will be. <laughs> but I kept in touch with one of the people that I wrote to who wrote back or two of them were these two amazing women, Lorene Scafaria and Dana Fox. Lorene wrote and directed Hustlers. If people saw that, which is incredible. And Dana just created the show called Home Before Dark, which is on Apple TV. And she's done uh, How to Be Single and Ben and Kate and all these, what happens in Vegas. I was huge fans of both of theirs. And neither of them needed an assistant, but they kind of agreed to be my pen pal of sorts. And, and so I kept that relationship open for as long as I could and tried to make myself as available to them as I could for any help that they needed. At the same time, I was trying to meet as many peers and people who were doing what I did or who maybe was like, were like a step ahead of me so that I could try and follow in their wake a little bit. And that's the way that I got my manager, this woman named Michelle Knudsen, who's incredible and is still my manager and, and one of my closest friends, is that I, ha I knew someone through someone at film school who had just signed with her and I, his name is John Whittington. He's another terrific writer. And I basically forced myself on him as a friend <laughs> until he agreed to connect me with Michelle. And then I sent my script to her. And I took kind of a windy road that way in that I had a manager for many, many years before I had an agent. And I, I had kind of gotten in my head the way I think a lot of people get in their heads that getting an agent is a victory, which it is. I mean, this is an odd time for writers and agents in general, but like, getting an agent makes a huge difference in being put up for or considered for or fought for certain open jobs where you're proving your worth that way. I felt that it wasn't worth having an agent until the agent really needed to work for me. Cause I think a lot of times you get an agent and that sounds great, but the script that you get an agent with or that you get meetings with is not something that usually sells. That's kind of a lesson that I needed to learn. I wrote when I was at Dartmouth, actually I took a screenwriting class with Bill Phillips. I don't know if he's still there anymore. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. He's my thesis I, advisor. <laughs> yes, he's the best. I wrote a script in that class and I continued to revise it. Like I, you know, finished it and was like, well, now I'm going to, I guess someone's going to pay me for this. I hadn't shown it to anyone. I was like, I've done it. It's 110 pages. And then I continued to revise it. That year I went to Columbia. I continued to revise it. That was the script that when my friend introduced me to Michelle, who ended up being my manager, I sent her. And, and, she, there are all these mini steps that right before you get there, I think to me at least, it felt like that'll be the thing where now it's professional and understanding that there are like many, many of them <laughs> was helpful to me because that script got me a manager, which was a huge deal. Then I moved out to Los Angeles and at the time I moved out, Dana Fox had just had a television show picked up. She suddenly needed an assistant, which was an incredibly serendipitous time for me. So I started working as her assistant while continuing to work on that script, which got me a lot of meetings, which was wonderful. And it took me kind of two or three meetings in to realize like, oh, no one's gonna buy the script or pay me for the script or make this into a movie, which I wish I had had a better understanding of like, this is the script to get me in the door in these places and meet people. And then it's up to me to keep writing scripts that will continue to get them excited. So I think not taking your foot off the gas in terms of each of these, celebrating each of those kind of monumental achievements, because they are all monumental achievements. Getting someone whose opinion you respect to read and like your script is a monument. I mean, finishing a script is a monumental achievement. Someone you respect liking it is a monumental achievement that should be celebrated. Getting an agent or a manager or taking those steps, all of those things are wonderful, but not seeing any of them as the be all and end all, I think is a really helpful engine and thing to remember as it's going. Because even after I had sold a script, 
it was hard for me to be like, I'm, I, I still would say like, I hope I'm, I'm trying to be a writer. I want to be a writer. And I think that's, then you get to a place where you can feel comfortable that way. But I, my, my greatest kind of, I guess, advice in terms of the specificity of how I did it is to just continue to reach out to people that you admire and see if you can learn from them and see if you can do free work for them. Before I got a, a, the job as Dana's assistant, Lorene was making another incredible movie I love called Seeking a Friend for the End of the World. And I asked if she needed an assistant. She didn't because the studio had hired her one. And I said, well, then can I just be your intern? And I flew out to Los Angeles and I would babysit as much as possible. And then whenever I had free time, I would go to set and just watch her work and see if I could do anything to help for free, which is a very you know privileged place to be, to be able to offer that work. But as often as you can can try and learn from people or, or work with people without needing something from them in return, even in terms of like them wanting to buy your script, like giving your script to people to read and, and getting their, their genuine advice without needing them to want to purchase it at the end, I think is all that stuff adds up to them putting you in the right place when it is eventually. That was a Thank very you. long answer. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're getting a bunch of questions in from the audience. Um, Madeline, I think, has, has a good follow-up to that. Madeline, you want to go ahead? Yeah, um, here's a few questions going off about your writing process. This one is from Katie Curry. She asked, um, what is your pro writing process like? Do you have a schedule for yourself when you're writing? And do you prefer to write alone or write with a partner? I love those questions. My process is kind of it tends to change from project to project. So sometimes I, I have written with partners before, like I've written with Dana before, which is such a blast. And that's a different that tends to be more scheduled because two people have to be on something at the same time. So that's a, a very easy way to be like, we're going to meet at nine, we're going to write till three, and then we'll both go home and we'll read over things. I, I like to try and schedule my day and myself. I, I know some people, I mean, I was just reading about how Phoebe Waller-Bridge like, likes to start writing at 10 p.m. in bed until 2 a.m. And I was like, I cannot do that. I, the, I need to be efficient in the morning or else I feel like I lose the whole day. But I like to outline pretty specifically, I, knowing it'll change. But I like to have so almost like a math proof. Like I know where we start and I know where we end up. And then the stuff in between you can kind of fool around with or figure out fun ways to get there. So my process is usually like two to three weeks of walking around, realizing I forgot how to speak English or how any movies work and that everything I've done before was a fluke and blue skying on an idea whether it's something like Booksmart where I know kind of what I want the arc to be this way or something like Set It Up where I know the log line and I think it could be fun. And then I'll make, a, I'll write down the scenes or the lines that make me most excited on note cards until I have enough note cards that I can kind of start to put them in an order that feels like a movie. And then I'll make a big poster board of all those note cards until I feel like I have an outline where I'm like, okay, I know where we start and I know you know, what happens on page 30 and page 60 and page 90. And I know these set pieces, which will be fun. And then I feel like I can start and knowing it'll be rewritten over and over. And in general, I like to write from like 830 to 330. And then anything after that feels like gravy, because at that point, it's like a school day, kind of. <laughs> All right. Um, our next question from the chat, um, Katie Ornstein, do you have one ready? Yes, I do. Um, so Elias Connolly asks a question that I've been thinking about a lot as well um, as I learn more about the industry. So you're someone, you, you're the credited, one of the writers on the film and you're also credited as a producer. You mentioned that you were on set. Um, how much were, are you thinking about production when you're script writing? Are you thinking about how do I, how do I get this made? Or are you thinking like, how, how do we make it happen? You know, um, or a kind of other side of that is, what are you doing when you're on set and you're the writer? Those are both great questions. So the first one, it kind of depends on what the script is. So like when I was writing Set It Up, I knew who my producers were and they were very supportive, Juliet Berman and, and Justin Nappy, who run this production company called Treehouse. And I got to write that script and just as the movie I wanted to watch as opposed to like, we didn't know who was gonna make it. We didn't know where we were gonna make it or how much money they'd have to make it. So I got to focus kind of exclusively on story and as if I was writing the movie I wanted to go buy a ticket for. 
which then no one had to do because it was on Netflix, which was great. But that was a really fun process because I got to just dive in story-wise. When I came on to Booksmart, and which was technically the rewriting of an existing script, they had the director, they had the studio, they had the production company, and I was writing it with my collaborator, Olivia, who was going to direct all of these things. So again, it's always fun, I think, and important to start from a story place and to write that first draft knowing like we just want to tell the best story. And then ideally, if you're lucky enough, you get to a place where they're going to make it and then you start to make production rewrites or you start to make cast rewrites when you realize who has been cast in something and how lucky you are based on the way they speak or their age or their vibe and you want to make changes that way. So it's it evolves as it goes. Then eventually, if you are a writer who's on set or a writer producer, you're making changes because you're like, well, the house we were supposed to go to fell through and the new house doesn't have a hallway. And so where can we put the hallway scene? Or like, for example, on Booksmart, we were so enamored with Billy Lord who played Gigi and Noah Galvin who played George early on that Olivia and I were like, how can we put them into as many other scenes as possible? Incl and the whole cast, I, the Nick's party it did not used to have so many people in it. And then we were like, we need to get as many of these people. Sometimes it's rewriting as you're going to the strengths of the amazing cast that you have. So as a writer producer on set, it's, it, it's it's both kind of writing for those real world changes as they're happening, which I find really fun, and kind of helping to make sure that the script matches the production and all the way through the post process sometimes too. Yeah, I just, Nick and I were just chatting before this. We were just like, oh my God, Billy Lord is so good in this movie. Incredible. Like, it's, it's terrifying, it's so good. <laughs> also, originally that karaoke scene was kind of a background scene and it wasn't supposed to be George and we just asked Noah if he would come to that mm -hmm. house. Because he, of course he would. And he, and he didn't know what song it was going to be until that morning. And you guys are their age, so you probably also don't know Alanis Morissette, but they didn't really know who she was or what that song was. This was pre kind of like the Alanis sounds that's been happening now. And so he learned that song that morning and then performed it. it was it's incredible. funny because I don't think a lot of people know that song, but for for me, when I watched it, I was like, his character would exactly know what exactly. that song is. He would have the performance have done years ago. It's so good. And then he's like, I dedicate this to my cast, classic theater kid. And then yes. at the end, when he's like, Alan, so good. <laughs> the greatest. Yeah, I feel like you totally nailed the theater crowd. In, in oh my God. I felt like I was yes. It was also nice day. because it was amazing. Beanie is like a lot of our cast was a part of that theater crowd and got to bring their own specific stories in there. I mean, that's what's great about a high school movie is most people went to a high school or a school at some point in their lives where they all have the, the same kinds of experiences. Like everyone feels like they have a Gigi or they knew a Gigi or that they had a George or that they had a Jared, Skylar Gisando, who's incredible. So that that's the beauty of these kinds of stories is that people all kind of get to bring their own memories to them. Well, that's great. Um, Nick, do you want to do one one quick question and then we'll we'll go to the last question? Um, sure. This is just a quick question from uh, Jordan Paff who asks, how do you deal with writer's block? That's, I mean, Jordan, you and me both. I don't, what do you do, Jordan? <laughs> but <laughs> um, I think I, one of the nicest things that someone gave me as a piece of advice is to just be gentle with yourself. That I mean, there are certainly scenarios where something is due. I mean, no one knows that more than college students. Something is due and it doesn't matter if you want to write it or not. You have to write it to hand it in at a certain point. I think the for me, the thing that works best with writer's block is to prepare early enough that if it comes, it's not a huge, huge issue. Like if you, usually you have about 12 weeks to write a script if you are contracted to write one, if you're not writing something on spec, which is for you. If you're able, if I'm able, I should say, to kind of organize my thoughts, get an outline down, prepare early enough that it feels a little bit like doing my homework on a Friday, then a bout of writer's block doesn't feel like the end of the world as much as it does if I've waited six weeks to start outlining and suddenly the script is due in four weeks. And if I don't have five pages done today, then my whole schedule is off. Because I think the sometimes the best thing to do for writer's block and the best thing for me is to just go do something else. Someone gave me that really great piece of advice one time, which is like, you can either have sat at your computer all day, miserable, and at 5 p.m. have no pages and nothing to show for it. Or you can have realized at 11 a.m. it wasn't going well, 
gone for a hike, had lunch with your friend. I mean, this is another time, like gone to see a movie and have no pages at 5 p.m. And at least then you like got some sunshine and you lived a little bit and you took your mind off of it in a way where if you release your white knuckle grip, that's when those ideas will come. So I think you obviously can't do that every day because then you won't write it. <laughs> but that knowing when the days are like, I'm going to give myself a break and be gentle with myself and let myself go out into the world and absorb things that will help me be better tomorrow to write. That helps me a lot. And I'm able to do that if I know I've kind of prepared myself enough to give the leeway time for that as opposed to. The other thing is just write the bad version of it. That's kind of the other most helpful piece of advice is writer's block is like I have no ideas but what it really is saying is I'm, I, I don't think any of my ideas are good because you can come up with anything. So if you have true writer's block and you're like, I'm just going to write the worst possible version of this scene, you can kind of, then it's out there and you're like, well, it can't be worse than that. So I can improve this in these ways. And there's something there to make better as opposed to just looking at a blank page and thinking of all the ways you could do it incorrectly. Well, thanks so much. And thanks, Jordan, for that question, because that advice, I think, is helpful for all kinds of writers out there. Um, we'll now go to our last question, which um, I'm going to throw to Katie. And then actually, I'd love um, you students if you want to chime in with your own answers. But um, last question comes from Meg Summerfield, who wants to know what strong female characters on screen inspired you um, in comedy or, or drama, but favorite strong female characters? That's such a great question. I We talked a lot about Cher Horowitz from Clueless, who is one of my favorite characters of all time, male or female, and someone who was a real box breaker, I think, in not being who people thought she was immediately and, and not being exactly who the cliche of her was. Um, we talked a lot about Thelma and Louise, two characters that I love. We, I mean, in, modern times now I'm thinking kind of more like recently but like obviously I think Fleabag is an incredibly inspiring character in every way both behind the scenes and on camera um I would say like I loved Harriet the Spy like that kind of energy and really inspired me a lot when I was little um I loved I mean there are too many of them it's such a good question all the women in the first wives club which I love like <laughs> one of my movies of all time um I like I I've, I've been watching a lot of Insecure. I think all the women on that show are so three dimensional and interesting and hilarious, which makes me really happy. Um, okay, you guys go. I'm gonna think of more while you guys go. <laughs> all right, Madeline, do you have one in in your mind? Yeah, I mean, right before you said Thelma and Louise, I was just about to say that I watched the movie oh. for, the, for the first time somehow during quarantine the other week, um, and I went down to tell my parents that I had just seen it for the first time, and they're like. This is so against all your life, what you stand <laughs> for. How have you just seen this? And I, like, after I watched that, I then watched it again the next night and I was like, okay, I need to stop doing this. But those two, <laughs> those two are going to, I can't believe that was the only time I've seen it, but they're going to stay with me for a while. Katie Ornstein, have yeah. you good? Um, well, I absolutely love Emma Thompson in Sense and Sensibility. I think it's, she radiates, I mean, she's not like kicking butt but she's you know she's emotionally strong and she is like just such a uh, it's that just you have to see that sense of sensibility the only it's so damn good um and then i've also been thinking a lot about buffy the vampire slayer and all of the women on that show and honestly all of the men on that show like just all of buffy mm -hmm. nick do you have a favorite strong female character i am a huge Cersei ronan fan stan um, so Lady Bird is one of my favorite like film characters of all time. Um, and the perfect companion film to Lady Bird that not a lot of people know about is Real Women Have Curves. So, so good. I love Real so Women Have Anna Curves. in Real Women Have Curves is another one. Like I felt, That's such a good answer. Yeah, I feel so <laughs> deeply connected to just her story in general. Ugh, I love that Everybody, movie. It's on HBO. Everybody go Everybody, watch Real You should Women go stream it if you haven't it's seen it. It's so good. America wow. Ferreira picks up that movie and walks away with it. It's ugh. And then she just like rides buses around Beverly Hills. Sorry, I just. <laughs> um, I would throw Princess Leia on there as well. Yes. As like the ultimate. And then she becomes the general. Yeah. I, well, with I would also, if I just to throw in one more, I think that um, if you've never seen Tangerine, I think Cindy and yeah. Alexandra and Tangerine are two of like the most badass women I've ever seen on film before. 
and would highly recommend. Highly yes, recommend. I would also throw in uh, Brooklyn Prince who plays Mooney in the Florida Project and is only five years old in that. Oh movie. my gosh. In Dana's new show, which is on Apple TV. And she is extraordinary. Yeah, that film was amazing. That was great. I guess I, for my favorite, I'd say um, Clarice Starling is is yeah. is a her hero of mine. Uh, Katie, did you think of any more while while we were going oh, around? I was just thinking about. Oh no, Katie, you make Katie still run. No, no I want to hear yours. What are yours? <laughs> um, I was thinking about how much I love my. Uh, someone in the chat said 20th Century Women, but I'm also thinking like Princess Diaries 2 Royal Engagement, like Anna Hathaway and the Princess Diaries films. It sounds like a joke, but it's it's like actually, like she's also running a country like yeah. very well. He's a politician. And Julie Andrews. Yes. I could go on forever. <laughs> a lot of good characters in Princess Diaries. Um, any Any last thoughts on strong female characters? This has been such a pleasure. Um, thank you so much, Katie Silverman, for, for joining so us. Thank you so much for having me. All these questions were so interesting and it was such so much fun to chat. Well, your your film has taken the campus by storm. Um, it was the orientation film this year. And that makes me so happy. Yeah, just um, it's it's really been such a positive force on the campus. And thank you so much for, for spending, spending time to share your thoughts and give us a little bit of a behind the scenes look look at the film. Um, next week for Small Screen Fun, we have a special brunch edition of the show. Um, we are continuing with our spotlight on screenwriters and joining us on Saturday, May 9th at 10 a.m. is Julian Fellows, the creator of Downton Abbey and award-winning screenwriter for Gosford Park. If you start now, I think you can maybe get through all six seasons of Downton before the brunch chat. But <laughs> until next time, keep calm, carry on, and watch some great movies. Thanks everybody. Bye, thanks guys. <laughs>